welcome keynote speaker Mass Lieber to the stage. Mass is former chairman of the Science Group Pollings Board of Directors and current group president, CEO of Gonfas, one of the world's largest pop manufacturers. Before joining Gonfas in 2014, Mass worked for the Lego Group for several years most recently as a member of the management board as chief marketing officer. In Lego as well as Gonfoss, Mass has been able to implement major changes even during hard times. Mass also serves as Denmark's ambassador in the Business and Sustainable Development Commission which has just published its report, Better Best Business, Better World. Mass is convinced that the UN World Sustainable Goals can become a lever to make design more influential and vice versa. That the world goals can be realized through design. We look forward to hearing more about that, but also about your thoughts on how to lead change and implementation. Because this conference is all about how do we redo our education and our research so that we get more impact. Thank you for coming, Mass. The stage is yours. Can you hear me? Great, good morning from my, me and my side as well, and thank you so much to Elspeth and the rest of the committee for hosting me here. Uh, I know the house uh, quite well, and I've had in this capacity, the, uh, as chairman previously here, I had the privilege to work with and also recruit one of the most passionate leaders I've ever met in my life, namely Elspeth. Uh, so, uh, so it's fantastic to be back here and also to see uh, a design community gathered here in, uh, in Colin. Now, I was really excited about uh, going here until yesterday, so pardon me, uh, I, I have to get something off my chest, uh, which, which is uh, the, the fact that, that uh, a genius decided uh, to abandon uh, the, the Paris Climate Agreement. And I have to say I'm, I'm disappointed, I'm agitated, and I'm angry. Uh, well, I have to say though, when I, when I look at both my own emotional reaction to that, and when I see both the international business community and political leaders all over the world, the thought struck me whether the man is so smart that he did this in order to only increase the motivation amongst the rest of us. <laughs> But considering everything else that's going on, that thought really left me anyway. So, uh, with that off my chest, uh, I want to speak about, uh, first, who, who I am. Uh, I, I have the pleasure to, uh, to still be associated here. I'm, in a, I'm a, an adjunct professor here at, uh, at the, the design school. I know very little about design, but I have a passion for design. And I think it's better to have a passion to, than to have knowledge, because one can follow the other, the other can follow the first. So, so I'm still happy to be, uh, to, 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 to be associated with the school and I'm a proud representative whenever I have the opportunity to do so. But apart from that, I've spent all of my adult life with these two fine companies, as Elspeth said, uh, two uh, who are both the world starters in their field, uh, but who are also very often misplaced in terms of what industry they are in. Because people think that Lego is a toy company and that Wolfers is a pump company. And that is actually wrong, because as you as you heard about on Tuesday, Lego is a, is a company that is about one of the most important things in the world, namely play and learning. And one of us is about addressing two of the world's biggest challenges, namely energy efficiency and water. But we just happen to make pumps. So those are the business philosophies that any business leader, I think, more and more should adopt to say what we actually do in the world, uh, and not only what do we make. Now, many people have asked me, what makes a reasonably sane person leave uh, a, a world of playful children and bricks and 
It's literally the only thing that can make an American immigration officer smile if you tell them you work for Lego. Uh, and I can tell you this. The same thing doesn't happen if you say you work for Bonfast. They look confused uh, and, and, and don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the thing is, when that opportunity to join uh, from one great company to another arose, the thing that actually convinced me, which I had absolutely zero idea about when I joined that company, was that 10% of the world's total electricity consumption is in pumps. Very few people know that, but even fewer people know that already with existing technology, that could be brought down to half. Uh, and considering that both of us is the world's largest manufacturer, and in a, in a sort of in a kind way saying we inspire all other competitors with the latest technologies to copy the most energy efficient uh, standards we make, then Goldfuss is a company that has a realistic opportunity, realistic opportunity to lower the world's total electricity consumption by percentages. And not many companies are led with, unless you're generally electric or seamless can clean them. And that is the single reason why I chose to leave uh, Lego, which I uh, will always be loved with because it's a fantastic company. Now, one a uh, few facts about that. Uh, the, the important thing is we're global. We have a lot of people. We are all passionate about making a difference. Uh, but we also sell around 60 million pumps in, in more than 60 countries. So about the same number of countries that is represented in this fine room from the design community today. Now, design has always been important for the company I represent. One could argue, one could argue that despite the fact that we have actually, during many years, won several design awards for the shape of our pumps. I mean, this is, this is one of, this actually won several design awards. Uh, and it is a wastewater pump that spends its entire life in sewage water. And you could say, what is the point of having a beautiful pump being hidden all of its life in sewage? Uh, and I have a sympathy for that. But on the other hand, I think it's also a philosophy sometimes to say, does design, does the physical design matter or not? I cannot prove to you that it is a good idea to spend lots of money and lots of time making beautiful pumps that are typically hidden somewhere. But I can prove to you that with the belief that design matters, there are many people, whether they admit it or not, whose decision is influenced by design. But this is the least important part of the design that we and companies like ours actually work with. Uh, I'll, I'll address it slightly more strategically now, because I'll just, I'll just lift myself up to what, I, what is the reality of most chairmen and CEOs of the world today. And three of the factors that we have to relate to, and I think they're only present right now in the international business community, that there's very little doubt, very little doubt, that uh, insecurity and unpredictability is a fact of life that any business in the around the world has to relate to. When you asked me in January of last year, what is the likelihood that Britain is going to leave the EU and Trump is going to be elected president, I would have said borderline zero. Had you asked me in January of this year, what is the likelihood that both Austria, Holland and France will vote with a reasonable sanity and the big leaders elected has a sense of responsibility, I was a lot less certain. But the fact is that business leaders should not spend their time guessing and making all kinds of scenarios. We should just increase our agility to adapt to whatever realities are there. So this is the first topic, and not, apart from that, I'm not going to spend time on that, but I am going to spend time on the next two, which is an accelerated digitalization and a what I call much more substantially and firmly rooted in the world, in the public, and amongst leaders. What is sustainability nowadays? Because for a business leader, sustainability used to have order, order in your own house, just to ensure that the media didn't write bad things about you, and then you are in good shape and you can focus on making money. That is fundamentally changing. Not everybody has seen that yet, but they will. The hard way or the less hard. So this is, uh, this is uh, two of the things I'll shed a little bit of light on the next 20 minutes, uh, also with a perspective on what can design do to help business and like Elspeth said, what can business do to fuel and accelerate the importance and the impact of design as well. So digitalization and sustainability, and I'll spend most time on the latter. Digitalization is a factor that is, it is something here which has such an accelerated and profound impact on anything that happens in the world, 
that 99 out of 100 people truly underestimate it. Just think about what the smartphone in your pockets, which didn't exist 11 years ago, does to your life. Think about what it does to the way we communicate, work, socialize, and how our children interact with each other. That is almost only a decade ago. Think about how we seek knowledge, how we learn, how we relate to each other, how businesses function. That is with a speed that if anybody thought that the speed of change was going to go down when Steve Jobs died, think again, it's only going to accelerate. In fact, the matter is that very few of us have the ability to keep up with it. And nine out of 10 CEOs are, even though very few of us uh, dare to admit it, are scared shitless about how is that going to impact even the existence of our business. So, what can we do about that? Uh, first and all, first, first and foremost, what, why does companies talk so much about digitalization? And I provocatively did this because there's so much talk about disruption, digitalization, and may not existing in a few years that I have sometimes a suspicion that it's almost the lemming effect that because everybody else does, I have to do it as well. Or it's because my CEO, my chairman says it's important, so I better do it because I'm not to get fired. Fact of the matter is, it is important, but let's not get carried away with just all the opportunities which are there because you can easily get this from that. Now, I see that this little blue arrow is the single most important thing about digitalization, and this, my friends, is where the design comes in. Connecting technology to people. And however insultingly simple that may sound, it is incredibly difficult. Because any company can get completely dizzy by listening to all kinds of technological advancement. And I have literally, on a weekly basis, I have people in my office who want me to take a fortified stand on so should our IoT communication standard be Zigbee or, or Wi-Fi or 4G or something else. And I say, I refuse to hear about it. Not only because I don't understand it, but that is not where it starts. I assume that the technology we need to solve the problem is there. I want, to tell, I want you to tell me about what is the problem we are trying to solve and how do you get the people who it's supposed to impact to actually want to use the technology. That's what I want to hear about. So this is about convincing whether it's a man in a suit, it's a child, or it's a housewife, or whoever it is, whoever it is, to deeply and profoundly understand how can technology and digitalization add value to them. And then when we found out, to convince them in a way where it's not forcing, but it's driven out of a desire to use, how can we do that? And I'll give you an example of why that is not only academia. There's a small company in Ireland, which I had the privilege to meet. Their value proposition to companies like mine, their target group is industrial companies or commercial buildings who has an electricity bill or energy bill of at least a million euro every year. Their value proposition is through digitalization, they will go in, they will make an energy audit, they will guarantee you, guarantee you a saving of at least 15% of that bill every year. They have no conditions, you're not going to pay a cent for it. And because they're a small company, they are assured by Munich Re, the world's second largest uh, assurance company, that if they should go, go bankrupt, the company will still have the savings. It is a completely irresistible value proposition. There is no reason in the world why any company should not grab that and say, thank you. They almost don't have any customers because of human beings. Human beings do not comprehend why it's a good idea. And that is where not only design thinking, but design, design acting and saying what is the trigger, what is the interface, what is the impetus that would make all of us business leaders say, of course I want that. Not a data scientist in the world, not a CEO in the world, no business person in the world can crack that off. But the people you educate can. They just haven't done it. So this is one of the examples of where the design world can truly help us by not only finding out what value proposition should we craft, but also how should we ensure that the people who it's meant for not only can see the light, but come running to us to say, of course, we should embrace it. So that's an example of what that can do. We are trying to do that by working directly with end customers and everything 
from uh, from windmill companies to some of the world's largest companies like uh, like uh, like uh, the Procter and Gamble, where we do intelligent fire protection in all of their buildings around the world uh, to, to do that. But we are trying to say how can we work and deeply understand the customer, spend time with them, and not uh, start with technology. And I'll give you an example of what we do, and I know this is very far from what most designers spend their time on, but I would argue that it is a design approach that actually made us come to this. Because many people in my organization say, we should have connected products, products that are connected with sensors and internet of things to the cloud so we can see all the data. I've not yet met a customer who says, give me more data. <laughs> <laughs> and at the same thing, when I buy a printer in my private home, if a pop-up box comes up and says, do you want to register your product? Hell no! <laughs> because all I'm going to get is spam mails. They don't give me a value proposition on why I should connect my product. So again here, we work with a customer, in this case Vestas, who do the world's largest uh, offshore windmill parts. And what we found out, by understanding what they do, understanding their processes, understanding their pains, and talking to the people who actually operate our, so other, other pumps. In here, in one of these nacelles up here, which is far out in the ocean typically, there is a pump that looks a little bit like this. That is the heart of the cooling system. If that breaks down, that windmill has, has 10 seconds to stop, otherwise it'll break down completely. And you can, you can probably imagine, now that I tell you about it, it's blatantly simple. That of course they do scheduled maintenance calls of these windmills, and they will go in, and they will up and check everything works, they'll sail home again. 10 minutes later, that pump could break down because it's rare, because they run all the time. But we have engineers who can say, if this pump vibrates in a certain way, we know for a fact that within the next 30 days the shaft seal is going to break down and you need to bring something. We can actually, by connecting that and telling the, the investors maintenance guys, next time you go on a scheduled maintenance call, you should bring this thing and replace it. That can save this company alone around 10 million Danish kroner uh, a year, just like that. And it is not because it's a differently designed pump, it's not because we need a different shape of the things we do, but we needed a design approach to actually do something different about it. So this is just, I'll finish all my talk about the digitalization with that, but it is foundationally and profound what companies like mine need from not only design thinking, but actually acting in terms of how to get human beings to adopt and understand the value of digitalization. Otherwise, we're going to waste a lot of money. Now, more importantly, and but even though still with a synergy, sustainability. Again, this is something that goes from just having order in your house to realizing that the world is becoming a place where we are uh, destroying it slowly but safely. There is climate change. I could argue, as a manufacturer of sewage pumps, of flood protection pumps, and uh, submersible pumps for water supply, that is fantastic. It's a business opportunity. Flux is a business opportunity. I can sell a lot more pumps, but I would not rather avoid those flux by ensuring that the world spends less energy. So this is a big problem. It's increasing, unfortunately, and likewise, the, the water, the global water challenge, is now for a second year in a row named by the World Economic Forum as the single biggest challenge the world has. Think about how many of the world's other problems stems directly back to water. Migration and refugees from Northern Africa and Middle East, what if they had plenty of water, well working agriculture and decent jobs in that region? We wouldn't have armed conflict, we wouldn't have migration. You can stem a lot of those factors back to saying how do we address the water challenges. And likewise, it's not only too little water, sometimes it's too, dirt, there's too much and sometimes it's too dirty. But it's a problem. And a related problem, uh, but, but something that is at least as heartbreaking, is that the inequality in the world, even though numbers prove the difference, there are still, there still an, an immense inequality in the world. That very often hits uh, women and girls, uh, and in this case, in many parts of Africa, the key reason why women and girls don't get an education is not only because of lack of education, in many cases because they're not allowed, because they have to walk 20 kilometers to fetch water. 
So availability of water in many, in many cases, the inequality from not having decent jobs, from not having decent education, and from having to do out of bare and desperate need, having to do something else, create an inequality which we cannot and should not accept. So this is just a few examples of why, obviously, as a global citizen, but also a business, as a business leader, that we are looking at a burning platform. But my plea to not just you guys, but also to the business community of the world is to turn that view and see it as a burning opportunity and a burning desire as well. Now, the wonderful thing is that the United Nations have made a fantastic platform and tool to navigate that, which is, which is sustainable development goals. And it is not something that gives any solutions, because that's super important for us all to internalize. This is a way to categorize some of the challenges. This is a way to categorize and systematize the way we can approach the opportunities and the challenges. But it does not give any solutions directly. Uh, there is no doubt that the business opportunity, uh, Elizabeth referenced this report, uh, Better Business, Better World, this proves that if only three of the world's major sectors, if addressed proactively and strategically, there's a 12 thousand trillion dollar potential for the world. You can remove three zeros from that, it will still be a slight shed of money, excuse my language. But it is, the business opportunity is there, but not by doing more business uh, as usual. But it is not only a threat, it is a huge opportunity. We have, at my company, we have chosen to say that where we can make the most profound difference is in climate action, so SDG 30, but even more importantly in SDG number six, water and sanitation. That will have a lot of spill-off effect on the other 15, but I personally believe that whether it is a design community, whether it is a company, picking where do I want to make the greatest difference and relentlessly pursue that opportunity is the best thing we can do to the world. Now, but, but there's a big but. I don't know if you know this book, I can warmly recommend it. It's written by a gentleman called David Meister, uh, it's called strategy in the fat smoke because you could think, okay, Mr. CEO, see so your strategy is to pick, you make a, want to make a profitable business and you want to do it by strategically leveraging STD 6 and 13. So that's your strategy. The thing is, you easily end up in this situation with this guy because he, he's written that strategy is like if an overweight smoker that doesn't feel well goes to the doctor, he's going to get the strategy from the doctor. But he already knows before he goes in the what's wrong. Because the doctor is going to tell you, quit smoking, drink less, eat healthier, and exercise more. So that's your strategy. $200, please have a nice day. That's the strategy. But how are you going to make the lifestyle change that will actually make you accommodate that? That's a difficult part. And again, that is where you guys come in. Because for some strange reasons, relatively few companies are able to cross that chasm from understanding conceptually that addressing the world's biggest challenge is a huge opportunity. And we want to take our companies into the future and hand them over in a better shape than we took them. But very few people are able to say, so how do I do that? And that is where you come in. Because we and many of us are not able to do it very effectively today. Now I'll give examples of how we are trying, and I want to reiterate trying. Because I don't want to, I don't want to claim that we in my company have all the answers, but we are trying. We had the privilege to win uh, one of the Danish design awards uh, here recently, and this is a, a small circulator pump. And, and one of the things we did, not that this saves the world, but just to give you an impression that these little circulator pumps are known, they are not more, much more than fist big. With the pumps that we have installed only in, from 2005 to 15 in Europe alone, so that's a relatively small part of the business. We have saved 4.5 gigawatts of power every year. That is approximately the total energy consumption of about three to five million people. That's the energy saving brought along by one product category in one region of the world. That shows the potential that we can do. But what is the adoption of this? Many people, I'm, I'm, not, I'm getting a little bit technical, sorry about that. But one of the things you can do to dramatically optimize your energy consumption in this household is to do something called hydronic balancing. Installers don't want to do it because it takes two people in the household and very few uh, householders are called to do it because they don't understand what the hell it is. 
So what happened was we made this little digital thing on top of a beautiful design pump and saying with that, the installer can do it with one person only and he can do it twice as fast and he can charge the same price to the homeowner. With the result now that we have tens of thousands of installers going out in Europe with a little digital device, putting it on, he can earn a lot more money on this. And the house owner is happy, the installers make more money, and we are saving substantial amounts of energy. With one little smartly designed thing with an interface that even an uneducated installer can understand. I know it's only a pocket-sized innovation but it's a small one and it makes a contribution. Second thing, address the same picture. Women and girls, we, 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 we care greatly about the developing world because of course it is nice that we can have more heating comfort in countries like Denmark, very privileged parts of the world. But when you see a refugee society or somewhere else where they simply don't have water, it is heartbreaking and it is unforgivable for us to not strategically address that. In Kenya, for example, we, we went in and thought we could sell them pumps, but what we found out was the problem was not availability. In this case with Nairobi water, the problem was not availability of water, they had water. It was even reasonably clean. The problem was that the distribution was unsafe and water pirates in many cases sold it for 10 times the price. So, so the people who really needed it could not afford it anymore. So what we developed instead was, was this kind of a safe distribution system with an ATM which was so simply, simply designed that the person who could not read, who had no literate skills, could still use the smart, uh, the, the, the mobile phone that they all have and the Ericsson and Pesa payment system to buy water credits and have safe distribution that they could actually get water. So where we thought we would go in and either sell more pumps or develop a new pump, we ended up through not only understanding the need, but designing a device that anybody, even with absolutely no education, could use, we found a different solution to address the water challenge, which was there. So this is just a couple of the examples. They're surely not the world's greatest examples, but they're ones that I know well and can tell makes a difference. Just a few examples of what we're doing. Uh, big numbers, but approximately 10% of the world get their drinking water from uh, from Grundfos. We transport more than 300 million cubic meters, and that the most the most heartbreaking thing, almost, is that in any in any city in the world, of all the clean water which is there, anywhere between 8%, which is world leading standard from this high country, up to 70% in cities, even in, in Europe, they lose the clean water due to leakage in their in their city in their system. And that can also be addressed through intelligent pumps that lower and increase the pressure depending on what is needed. And through relatively few, relatively few of these installations, we are saving millions and millions of cubic meters of clean water uh, every year. Now, but we cannot do that alone. And that I think is the realization, I'm soon coming to the end, but the realization is that companies can do less and less on their own. I have deliberately not taken uh, any design institutions on here because that is still to come. But I have no doubt that like we work with an increasing number of technology partners and very in many cases also with NGOs because they are the ones who know and can help us understand the problems we are solving. Most companies have to learn to give up control to make a greater impact. CEOs hate to let go of control. We want our business, we want to embrace it, we want to say it's ours. But if we want to make a profound difference, we have to open up to work with other people and understand that we need to take a very shared responsibility. And that also means in terms of in terms of professions that need to collaborate. Already in my days working with Elizabeth, we said engineers and designers need to learn to work together. But it's more complex than that. Of course they do. But the thing is now that the CEOs of the world the engineers of the world, the designers of the world, and so, I'm sorry for prototyping, but even more profoundly, the data scientists of the world need to work together. And trust me, understanding the brain of a data scientist is damn hard. So it is a super important challenge where collaboration between functional borders in order to create an impact, that has always been difficult. But that is increasing exponentially, but please, please let us not give up but insist to understand how we can join the creating it. And therefore, the, I mean, many much smarter people than me have said it, but the thing is, 
in order to make scalable difference in the world, we need to insist that we, any business in the world does good, to, does something which is good to people, to the planet. But we also need to ensure that everybody, no matter their political conviction, understands that making money is a prerequisite for having something which is scalable over time. Unless you build the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, your money is going to run out, and then you can't do good anymore. And there's no interest rate, so that we won't need to even help. You need to understand, and the occurring thing is, all the NGOs we work with, they want to, they accept and understand we want to make money. They accept and understand that the only way we can make a scale and enduring difference is by also making money on what we do. Now, now I come to what I promised Elizabeth to do. So how do I write change? I have four very, very simple principles. I apply them in my personal life, but I also apply them, apply them in the business I run. Very simple, and sorry if you take insult from it because it is so blatantly obvious, but it works. Uh, one thing is, if you want to make a choice, if you want to change something, pick something which is important to you. Not something that other people think is important that you truly and deeply don't. Pick something that matters where you can feel in your stomach, this is important enough to me to make a choice. If you can't do that, don't make a choice. Don't go there, don't even bother. Continue as is. Second thing, pick something you're already good at. For whether it's a company or a person, if you pick that you want to do something from now on that you're not good at, it would be like if you are a, if you're the world's best winemaker and you say, now oh, I want to make beer. There's a huge opportunity for beer in the beer market. Race, fine market analysis. But everything you know about making wine will give you zero good in brewing beer. There's no, absolutely no synergy between them. And likewise, I mean, I, I have a commercial education. If I choose to do something which is completely out of what I'm good at, the likelihood of me succeeding is zero. So I always advise whether it's a company or a person, start with something you're good at. It's okay that it takes you acquire new skills, but start with what I call a capability-based strategy. Second. Make firm promises that you can actually keep. I love ambition. I even love stretched ambition that almost feels intimidating. But then the only almost. Because as good at this as it feels to launch a super ambitious thing, that when you do it, two days later when reality is kicking, it's gonna be super frustrating. So ensure you do something, make promises to yourself that you can keep. And then most importantly, and that's the only place where I have pictures as well. Make your commitment visible. When I started three years ago in Bonfoss, I said two things because my, my predecessor was, was, a, was sort of accused of being, you don't communicate, we don't know who you are, we don't know what you're thinking, we never see you. Uh, so I said, I want visibility to go up dramatically, transparency of what we do, and customers will almost forget, forgot, because it's all about technology. So what I did, and I told everybody about it on the internal social media platform and I shared pictures of it. I exchanged my door with a glass door so that everybody could see into, directly into my office. And of course that was nice and everybody said, applauded me and said, what a nice guy. That's not the important thing. The important thing is every day, every day when I go into that door, I'm reminded about my commitment and I promise. Every day when I see that glass door, of course, others think about it, but it's better first and foremost to myself. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the best parking spots outside our head office were for uh, executive management. My parking spot was the closest to the entrance door, which meant that on a rainy day, which we have many of in Denmark, I could have the shortest walk. I said, no way in hell that should happen. So I reserved the best three parking spaces for customers and parked further behind myself. And that means when I walk on a shitty day and I get soaking wet, it's a reminder that customers are more important than anybody. So those are just things that on a daily basis remind me of commitment. So whatever physical manifestation you can make of your commitment, do it, both to other people but first and foremost to yourselves. Now, I'm finishing off with this and this is not, I was not invited to the UN General Assembly Hall or meeting with the Pope because I'm a particularly interesting person. I would love if that was the case. It is not a first thing. But it is because the way that my company is trying to profoundly change the way business philosophy is driven, including embracing more professions and how we make a difference, 
is something that people with very influential is more and more understanding is important. And then, very final thing, this is my plea to you. I would absolutely love, I gave a slightly more specific plea to, to, to Elspeth, but I thought now that there are so many bright people in the room. This is what I would give as a plea to you. How can you help us in business? We do both the conventional thing, because that is, there's one thing the design community is good at, is to challenge conventional thinking. And how can you help us break down the barriers between people and technology? And I don't only mean sort of uh, make people understand digital technologies. If we don't break down the barriers between people and technology, we are going to only make inequality worse because automation in the world will remove even more of the decent jobs we have. How can we change that for once and ongoing and profoundly? So, final picture. I at least remind myself every, every time I'm in doubt of what to do, I remind myself about what kind of a what what kind of a uh, of a retirement speech do I want to have? I, I use this one on the left to say I, I I want people who want to give the kidney for success of the company, uh, and, and I'm only partly joking with that because if you don't have people who are deeply passionate about what they do, don't do something else. Uh, and find, and on the left side, whenever I'm in doubt on a rainy day, and, and if I get a little bit tempted to maximize the financials due to my own personal bonuses, I just remind myself of what kind of a retirement speech do I want to have? Do I want to have one where I make some of the richest people in the world even richer, or do I want to have a world that I was part of addressing some of the world's biggest challenges? And I know what I want. Sorry about going over time. So uh, that, was, that was what I had for you. I hope you made sense.